Hi, everybody. Welcome to a very special Thursday edition, last minute snow rescheduled edition of the Humanities Forum. Pleased to see that you could all make it. Uh, my name is Ian Bernhoft. I direct the Humanities Forum, which most Fridays during the semester, we gather together and bring the Providence College community together to hear from scholars and journalists from around the world, to deepen our appreciation of the humanities, and to encounter new ideas and fresh perspectives. Uh, today's talk is co-sponsored by the Dialogue, Inclusion, and Democracy Lab, or the DID Lab, which is led by Dr. Quincy Beverly and Dr. Nick Longo. And they're leading an effort called Conversations for Change, with support from the Arthur Vining Davis Foundations, to create a more inclusive culture on campus. Uh, one of the faculty associated with that project is Dr. Sam Murray, who I'm going to call up in a second to introduce the speaker. But before I do, I just want to give you the, the ground rules in case you haven't been here before. What you, need to ex what you should expect and you know, brace yourself for, right? So the first thing is, we're going to run for about 75 minutes. So around 5.15, give or take, we'll wrap things up. After which time, there is a reception just down the hall in the Fiendella Great Room, where you're encouraged to continue the conversation and have you know, some tasty food as well. And you also, if you're a student, you should know that the tradition is that the first question is always asked by a student. So when our guest you know, gets to the end of his talk and turns the mic over to you, don't just sit back and wait for a professor to say something, because we're not going to say a word. Uh, the last note is, if you could take those laptops and just shut them down like that, so that you can fully focus on the talk and on the conversation, that would be phenomenal. With that, I'm going to hand the microphone over to Dr. Sam Murray. Thanks, Ian. OK, uh, so it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. John Tomasi to the Humanities Forum. Uh, Dr. Tomasi is the inaugural president of the Heterodox Academy, um, which is a nonpartisan, nonprofit membership organization. Thousands of faculty, staff, and students committed to advancing the principles of open inquiry, viewpoint diversity, and constructive disagreement to improve higher education and academic research. Uh, their vision is actually to encourage viewpoint diversity in the classroom and on campus, uh, done partly by encouraging uh, 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 and welcoming constructive disagreement. Um, now, before he went to the Heterodox Academy, he was uh, the Romeo Elton Professor of Natural Philosophy at Brown University, where he taught courses uh, in philosophy and political science for uh, over 20 years. Um, he was a renowned undergraduate teacher. He won two awards for undergraduate teaching. Um, and was known for facilitating student discussions as part of his seminars that centered on very difficult topics like the nature of prosperity, uh, wealth creation, uh, the idea of the university, and many others. Um, he once actually brought uh, one of the Koch brothers into his seminar to respond directly to student uh, queries and criticisms, maybe more of the latter than the former. Um, he also worked with the, I think, supervised the Janus Forum uh, lecture series which was known for hosting um, speakers who wanted to talk about difficult themes or issues, and it ran the gamut from uh, John Woo to the uh, Ben and Jerry's guys. Um, uh, and they would talk about topics like teachers unions, the US support for Israel, and wealth inequality. Um, uh, so I actually had initially planned to read out a lot of John's accomplishments, but it ended up being like 45 minutes. So I think I'm gonna stop there. Uh, and please ask you to join me in welcoming uh, Dr. John Tomasi. Thank you so much. Does that, yes, that works, yeah. Um, so um, Ian and Sam, thanks, thanks, for, thanks for inviting me. Thanks to all of you for coming. Did you have to come? I usually, when I, when I had events at Brown, I would usually make uh, chunks of students come. And then I sort of felt that you know, if you make people come, you owe them something halfway decent. Not that they always discharge that obligation, but that was at least how I thought about it. But whatever brought you here, 
Um, I appreciate your coming. What I want to tell you right from the beginning is that um, my talk is called When Providence College Speaks, What Should It Say? And often, maybe usual, usually, when a speaker uh, labels a talk with a question, that's a signal that they're going to answer the question and propose an answer to the question to you. That's not going to happen today. I actually have no idea. I, mean, I have an inkling, but I don't have much of an idea of what, co what Providence College should say when it speaks. But I want to talk with you about that question. It may sound like a strange question, Providence College speech, what does that mean? It speaks all the time. It's speaking right now, uh, like on with the wall, another, another, another way. It's speaking to me in a whole bunch of different ways right now that we'll, that we'll talk a little bit about. But I'm actually bringing the, the topic, the title of my talk is actually um, the question I want to ask you. And I'm hoping that we can talk about it a bit together. So I'm going to be talking about the question about university speech, which may seem like a strange question. But I think when I start talking about it, you'll see that it may be more familiar than it first seems. And one of the challenges of university speech, when people like me think about university speech, is that we often develop doctrines that explain when universities should speak, say when a university leader, for example, should, makes a statement on some political controversy or some moral controversy. We often develop those ideas separate from the concerns of Catholic colleges. A lot of the people who work on this stuff come from the University of Chicago, where they have, they have the Chicago principles and their Chicago ideals. And I'm really interested to find out and to talk about with you if you'd like, if, you, if you're willing, if we have the pure model from the University of, University of Chicago's answer to the question, when the university speaks, what should it say? How do we take that answer and drop it onto a campus like PC? What, how does the context change some of the principles? So that's what's going to happen. And I'm going to start just by saying a few things about uh, universities speaking. I recognize it may be strange. So I'll start in 1653. Um, Henry Dunster, uh, the first president of Harvard College, and as the first president of Harvard College, he was the first president of any college in the United States. He decided, this, this president of Harvard College, to weigh in on one of the most, one of the great social controversies of the day, 1653. And the problem was the problem of infant baptism. Uh, a forerunner of the American Baptists, Dunster believed that only adults were covenantally fit to receive baptism. Using his presidential bully pulpit, um, at Harvard, Dunsford issued the following declaration as president of Harvard, quote, all instituted worship hath some express word of scripture, but pedo baptism hath none. Bold words in Puritan Cambridge in 1650. Alas for Dunster, the expression of that proto-Baptist view was deemed heretical um, in Cambridge. Within a year, President Dunster was forced to flee, or forced to resign the Harvard presidency, and he fled with his family to the relative sanctuary of Situate Mass. Dunster, the first, college, the first American, American college president, was also the first to use his position to try to weigh in or try to, try to, to, try to influence a controversial social and political affair. But he was not the last. Over the years, and at an increasing pace, university presidents have weighed in on many social controversies, you know, taking the prestige of their university or college to try to put that on, this, on the social scale to tip things in, their, in a direction they thought, they thought important. So presidents have spoken out about things like prohibition, membership in the League of Nations, uh, World War I, domestic communism, universal military service, the Vietnam War, affirmative action, gun control, racism, climate change, abortion, a Republican winning their pres a recent presidential election, a Democratic candidate losing a recent, the same recent presidential election, police brutality, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and more. It's natural to focus on presidential statements but it's not only, and you've probably received some in your time here, 
from your president. You call your president? Yeah. <laughs> but, it's not only president, but it's not only presidents. So it's natural to focus on the official statements released by presidents. But it's not only presidents who have sought to exercise this expressive function of universities. The sem faculty senates and other campus groups often pass resolutions through which collectively they seek to make their views of their university known. Indeed, the decision of faculty senates to speak on behalf of their university seems to embolden other groups on campus to do likewise, sometimes resulting in muddled messages. For example, in 2004, the faculty senate at the University of Alabama passed a resolution condemning hate speech, which is a restriction on, on, on speech. The Alabama Student Union, the next week, responded by passing a resolution endorsing free speech. And I'll just add roll tide, or whatever you say. Go tide, roll tide. The expressive function of universities is not limited to verbal statements. Looking at the wall over there. When a university names a building after a donor, it expresses gratitude to that donor, and perhaps by proxy to the university's other donors, um, past and, I suppose, future, they hope as well. So too, when universities remove plaques and monuments from campus, or when they erect new ones, like the huge silver flame that I walked by when I came over here, they're publicly expressing the values of that university or college. This too, though, is fraught terrain. For example, in 2003, Brown President Ruth Simmons, who was the first black um, Ivy League um, president, was fiercely criticized by some Brown alums and loudly applauded by others when she erected a campus monument on the main green, acknowledging the connection of John Brown, uh, the founder of Brown, um, and thus of, the of Brown University, to the transatlantic Atlantic slave trade. Similarly, there's a fabulous sculpture garden on the campus of Chapman University in Orange County, California. Have any of you been to Chapman? Find an excuse to go to LA and go to Chapman. It's a remarkable campus. But in the sculpture garden, there are busts, sculptures, of Ronald Reagan, Margaret Thatcher, Milton Friedman, and Ayn Rand. Those four busts, plus one by Albert Schweitzer, have recently been deemed problematic. These are all free market heroes, right? They're, they've been deemed problematic by the Chapman community. And so at Chapman College today, they're actively debating about how or whether the garden sculpture, statuary might be adjusted to better reflect the values of Chapman University now. Universities also express their values, they also speak, in their selection of recipients of honorary degrees and other badges of distinction, including sometimes the invitation of speakers, who they choose to invite, who they choose not to invite, which topics they invite speakers on, which talk, topics they decide not to. These are expressive things they do. In 2006, Columbia University famously invited and then canceled a lecture by, by Iran's president, Ahmadinejad. In 2007, President Lee Bollinger of Columbia re-invited Ahmadinejad to campus and served as host himself of that lecture. So he introduced them and shared the podium with his distinguished speaker. As the host, also infamously, Bollinger criticized Ahmadinejad, his guest, calling him, quote, a petty and cruel dictator and describing Ahmadinejad's Holocaust denial, which he's infamous for, he is for, as, quote, brazenly provocative or astonishingly un uneducated. Bolgen was criticized for both parts um, of that decision. Expressive behaviors by universities um, often seems unavoidable. Are universities to invite, are universities to, universities to invite no speakers, to erect no monuments, award no honorary degrees? It almost seems impossible to be neutral about these things at least not to be fully neutral. But starting with President Dunster of Harvard, the issuing of official statements by university presidents has been a focal point 
of controversy. And in recent years, as I mentioned, we've seen a steady increase in these presidential statements being made. Many presidents have found it politically expedient to get out in front of, 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 of issues, um, which typically has meant issuing statements that are relatively uncontroversial, at least to those in the majorities on the campus in which they, are, 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 in which they, which they govern. Still, things are, now here, we're coming now closer to you and us now, still, the deliberate attacks on Israeli civ civilians on October 7th have cast a harsh light on the confusion and contradictions about university speech statements. And many of you probably, I'm sort of in this business now, so I probably watched it closer than, than, than you all, but you probably did some things, probably saw some things, and maybe, and maybe something's happened at PC too, where university presidents who are very, have become very accustomed to issuing relatively non-controversial statements George Floyd, Black Lives Matter, whatever it might be, those presidents found themselves now confronting the Israeli-Palestinian conflict with a topic in which they could find no safe thing to say. Anything they said, there'd be some group on campus or alums or donors, whoever it might be, who was really unhappy with the formulation of the statement they made. Now, one example, and my favorite, um, at Cornell, at Cornell, the president released three different statements in six days about the attacks. Each of those statements differing significantly in tone and in substance. We were watching college presidents, not just at Cornell, I don't mean to pick on them, I was giving a talk there a few weeks after, after the, those, those statements came out. <laughs> and I was, I was hard, trying, hard, trying real hard um, <laughs> to, to be gentle. Um, but we've seen this all, all around the country. Uh, presidents stuttering, trying to decide, you know, what do they do in a situation like this? What, do they, what can they say? What should they say? How do you, once you're in the business of speaking, how do you speak the right way for everybody, given that people see the right way in very different, very different ways? So, you know, moments of confusion and, uh, and conflict, like we've been seeing uh, across universities, especially in light of, the, of the, those attacks and the, and the Israeli response, these moments of conflict send us back to first principles and in search of clarifying norms. And that's going to mean, in this case, that we go back to the University of Chicago, as I mentioned before, and examine what the people in Chicago have traditionally thought about this question. When the university speaks, what should it say? Or more precisely, I guess, when the university president issues a statement, what should that, what, what, what rules should guide um, presidents when are considering issuing a statement? And the classic answer to that question is this beautiful little report that I'm just gonna, I know your laptops are, your laptops are closed, but I'll just ask you to put it in your brain and maybe Google it after this talk. There's a report called the Calvin Committee Report, K-A-L-V-E-N, not Calvin and Hobbes, K-A-L, E-E-N. And that report, which a lot of people around the country have been reading, especially since the October attacks and counterattacks, that report is this, um, this little gem. And it's, I, I think of it as sort of a great rarity in academic writing. It is extremely well written. It is extremely deep and important. And it's also super brief just two pages long. So if you have a chance, a spare 15 minutes after this lecture maybe, check out the Calvin Committee report, which gives an answer to the question, when should the university speak? And their answer, which I'll talk about now, is roughly that the university should not speak. Let me say something about that. So Calvin, that Calvin report, which, which was published in 1967, it's a classic, it's becoming a classic as time goes by, so 67, it's being published in the, the committee report was coming out in the wake of um, a lot of kind of interesting social situations. 10 years or so before the Calvin re report came out, there was a big push uh, called the Broyles Bill in Illinois to require universities to submit lists 
um, of all the known communist sympathizers on their campuses. So there was one question, should universities release statements about which of their professors, and maybe students too, but professors was the focus of Broyles, which professors are thought to be communist sympathizers. And also in 67, there were on many campuses, including Chicago, you know, stuff going on about the Vietnam War. A lot of people wanted universities, their university to stand up and take a position on that issue. There was also the beginnings of a movement about boycotts in South Africa that was starting to sprinkle into student conversations and students were now asking university presidents to say, listen, shouldn't our university stand up and be counted on these great social issues? Or the Civil Rights Act had just passed a few years before. So it's a time of incredible social controversy. And this committee was put together, led by a famous, a very famous um, First Amendment lawyer, probably the most, maybe the most important First Amendment theorist of the 20th century, a guy by the name of Harry Calvin. And the Calvin Report, this little two-page gem that I mentioned, it, it says that, according to Calvin, universities have an important role to play in the improvement of society. And that role, the role that universities play in the improvement of, of society, is, is given and defined by the unique function of a university, namely, the discovery, improvement, and dissemination of knowledge. Universities are primarily about the search, the, contest, the contested and ongoing search for knowledge, and also the dissemination of knowledge collected through time. But the pursuit of knowledge, the Calvin report goes on, is intrinsically upsetting to established traditions. Thus, Calvin says, let's make this work, says this, a university faithful to its mission will provide enduring challenges to social values, policies, practices, and institutions. By design and by effect, the university is the, is the institution which creates discontent with the existing social arrangements and proposes new ones. In brief, a good university, like Socrates, um, will be upsetting. And yet, the report goes on, the instrument of dissent, the thing that does the, the, the dis descendendum, the thing that does the dissenting at universities, is not the university itself as a collective, rather it's the individual scholars and the individual students. Again from Calvin, the university is the home and sponsor of critics. It is not itself the critic. To perform its Socratic function, Calvin report tells us in this little crunched two-page thing, the university must sustain, quote, an extraordinary environment of freedom of inquiry. And thus it must push back against, quote, political fashions, passions, and pressures. In the idea, their idea is that if you, if the university president or if the faculty senate or if the undergraduate council, perhaps, too, speaks on behalf of the university on some social controversy, if they stand up and be counted, that they insist that their university stand up and be counted on behalf of the cause that they think is so important, that in the context of the university, where people by our very nature for doing our jobs right and creating a university and bringing a student together into classrooms, will see the world in importantly different ways, so they can learn from one another, we can grow and have that upsetting function that Calvin talks about. That if we have a collective form that produces a single statement on some controversy, we're gonna chill dissent. We're gonna undercut our own purpose. So Calvin goes on um, that the university is a, is a kind of community, but a very special kind of community, one rooted in free and perpetual contestation. Any attempt by university, university president to quote, speak for the, universe, for the university on a social controversy would undercut the rationale, would undercut the very rationale for the university's existence. Universities are not political bodies, essentially. They're bodies for research. And to do research requires that a variety, that opinions be allowed to diverge 
that they be in fact perhaps encouraged to diverge so that we can learn more from one another by having our own assumptions challenged in ways that we can't see well from the inside. So when any individual or group presumes to take a position on behalf of the whole commu university community, they do, they do so at the price of censuring any minority who does not agree with the view adopted. So the Calvin report says that people should, that universities should adopt a policy of what they call institutional neutrality. That the institution as a university or a college should remain neutral, as neutral as possible, on the controversies of the day. And they emphasize the neutrality of the university as an institution arises then not from a lack of courage, nor out of indifference and insensitivity to the urgent issues of the day. Rather, that neutrality, that ideal of neutrality, arises out of respect for free inquiry and the obligation to cherish, cherish a diversity of views. So you don't do this, they don't recommend this simply because it's a way to avoid social controversies or angry alums or angry donors. They recommend it, the committee recommends this for Chicago out of a, as a kind of public display of Chicago's commitment to, to this ideal of free inquiry and respect for uh, view, viewpoint diversity. So in response to the opening question, when the university speaks, what should it say? Or when the president of, of a college speaks, what should they say? Um, Calvin argues for a policy of institutional neutrality. And Heterodox Academy, the organiz international organization of professors that I left my comfortable job at Brown for some weird reason to run, Heterodox Academy strongly endorses this idea of institutional neutrality, pretty much precisely because of these reasons. But there's going to be some twists, as, you're going to, as, as we're going to see, especially here at PC. Um, so they say, on Cal Calvin says that the university should not speak out on issues that are matter matters of reasonable moral or political controversy among the membership of the community. And on occasions when the university cannot avoid political expression, inviting people, putting up plaques and so forth, it should seek to say as little as possible. It should minimize those expressive functions. Now, that's sort of the background. What I'm really doing is I'm trying to give you some, I'm trying to put some tools on the table that we can think about together. So one big tool that I put on the table now, the main tool, is this idea of, of institutional neutrality. The claim from Chicago that university presidents, university leaders, should aspire, should strive to be quiet, to be neutral about social controversies that are raging in society. Not, again, not out of indifference or lack of concern, but out of respect for each of you, and out of respect for all your faculty, all, the, all your teachers and the faculty in this room, out of respect for, their, for the possibility that some of them may think differently about these issues. And I'll just give an example uh, that just, you know, just occurs to me as I'm speaking. After the George Floyd a murder in, the, in police custody, presidents around the country issued statements decrying what happened to George Floyd and saying that it really re requires that we do a, a reset about understandings about race in this country and on universities too. It was widely, statements like that came up from presidents all across the country. And at Brown, a statement like that came out too. Our Brown's president issued a strong statement saying, we're gonna double down and try to root out racism and understand what it is better and try to get serious about this issue finally. One of my closest friends at Brown, a black professor, <laughs> a very famous professor named Glenn Lowry, who some of you may have heard of, an economist, the first black tenured um, economist at Harvard, been at, was at BU for a while, now he's been at Brown for some time. Glenn Lowry disagreed with, president, with the Brown president's statement. He thought, we didn't actually know what happened in that instance in that day. We didn't know that George Floyd's death indicated systematic racism by the police. Glenn's kind of a contrarian. He, so he issued, he issued his own statement, objecting to the president's statement, saying, don't speak for me, allow me to speak for myself. And when I speak for myself, 
I'm probably going to think about racial issues very differently than you, the president of Brown, do. I just mentioned that as an, as an example of a person. Glenn's a really strong personality. I mean, super strong personality. So he wasn't chilled at all. He was you know, kind of warmed up to speak. But the idea is that a lot of other people on campus might just kind of like keep quiet about the issue rather than actively say what they think about it. And insofar as people are being quiet or lulled into not speaking or acquiescing to the general view espoused by the university president and the top leadership, then all the community is lo loses something. We're a less lively community. We're a less intellectually alive community. We may start to fall asleep at the wheel rather than ongoing contestation and movement. So with the October attack, as I mentioned, everything's been being rethought about these, this practice of making institutional statements. And like I mentioned, the Cornell president, but many, many presidents found themselves issuing statements and being criticized for alums or donors for what their statement was, too weak, too strong, criticized by students, student groups for the same reason or other reasons sometimes. And um, that was it sort of led to a presidents to rethink their policy about making so many statements. And so across the country, a variety of different uh, universities adopted a new policy of neutrality. So they rediscovered this old Calvin report. Read it really quickly, it's only two pages. And I said, you know what? I know. <laughs> I'm not, at Cornell, I'm not going to issue statement four on day seven. <laughs> I'm going to rest on day seven. And I'm not going to say anything. And in fact, in fact, I'll adopt the Calvin approach. And, and at, at, at Williams, for example, um, their president, um, who used to be the dean of the College of Brown, she issued a statement saying, listen, I used to always issue a statement on everything. You guys know that. This is a, a statement she wrote to the whole Williams community. But she said, you know what? I'm going to change. I'm, changed my, I'm, I'm, I'm done with that. I'm moving on. I'm going to adopt. New, I've seen the wisdom. She said she, that she learned and grew and wanted to adopt the wisdom of, of the Calvin approach of neutrality, of no longer making statements. At, um, at Stanford, uh, they issued a statement affirming institutional neutrality, that they would make no statement on this, on this issue. They came under, under heavy attack for adopting neutrality when it came, at this very moment. Like now when you're killing Jews, all of a sudden you adopt neutrality. And Stanford, after issuing the statement and their commitment to neutrality, issued a statement condemning the attack about a week later, which is not, not supposed to do that if you're neutral. At Northwestern, just one more, at Northwestern, which is, you know, right there in Chicago, right next to the University of Chicago. At Northwestern, their president, who's a pretty remarkable person, issued a really strong statement saying, listen, this is one of these times when our, we're committed to neutrality. We have been for a while. But this is one of these times when you, well, a lot of people want us to speak out on the attack and the counterattack, but we're not going to do it. We're going to be completely neutral. Northwestern's going to stay neutral. We're going to make no statement about this. But then two days later, he said, listen, I'm not speaking for the university here. I'm speaking for myself. And he, said, he was Jewish, and he said, I was a Jew, blah, blah, and he completely condemned the attack as a private citizen. Now, so you would see that lots of people were looking at Calvin, trying to find a way to get out of the situation they were in. What had been really kind of an easy practice had become suddenly very fraught terrain. And, there's, and for a lot of people, maybe not those leaders, but for some people, some presidents who I speak with, who are thinking about adopting Calvin, there was a certain sense that, for them, the Calvin, the Calvin report was like the, Cal, was like the, the rescuing, rescuing cavalry coming over the hill to save you. Here's what you can do when this public relations disaster that you're walking into, you can see it getting worse as, time, as the counterattack goes on. You can just be quiet. So there's certain, I, I call it, the, I think of it as like the Calvin of convenience. You adopt neutrality because it gets you out of a sticky situation as a communicator. Um, so there's one way to adopt Calvin, which is uh, kind of strategic. Um, but there's more to the story. Adopting Calvin, that principle that I mentioned, is not the end of a conversation. In fact, if you look at that two-page document, adopting Calvin in many ways is the, the beginning of new conversations. Because Calvin is a form of cavalry that carries with it question marks. I'm going to show you some of those question marks now, then we can have some conversation together. 
When should I stop? What do you want? Okay. I'm just doing the accordion in my mind. Okay. Got it. So, um, I mentioned this guy, Harry Calvin, who wrote the report. He's, he chaired the committee. So Harry Calvin died um, in 1974. He was 60 years old. His son, Jamie, um, was a young journalist in his late 20s at the time. And Jamie um, loved his father. <laughs> and his father, you know, his father was working on this massive book, which he had. He, his father died at his desk working on this, his masterwork. So his son, Jamie, I think he was 28 at the time. He just changed, he, he changed his life course, and he spent the next 10 years working through his father's papers, turning his massive piles of paper, his, last, his great manuscript, into a book. And along the way of putting together that manuscript and going through all of his father's papers for a decade, um, he read all the notes from the Calvin Committee. He read all the inside conversations that those people had that led to this little tiny two-page crystalline gem of a report. All the nuance that was boiled down into this little beautiful vial of, of a committee report. And what he, what he, Jamie Calvin became increasingly worried of what we might call a kind of Calvin absolutism that has riven, that sort of like built up around the Calvin report. The Calvin looks like a pretty uncompromising commitment to saying nothing on any issue. University leaders should just be quiet, and that's the end of the story. And Jamie thinks that's not the right reading. From reading of the stuff what the committee was talking about, he thought you can see more nuance than the lies behind the report. And I'll just mention that I have a podcast called Heterodox Out Loud, and we, did a, we, we dropped a special um, issue, a pop-up issue of it last night where I talked to Jamie Calvin about these issues I'm going to talk with you about a little bit right now. So Jamie, um, he says that, Jamie says that the intention of the committee was twofold. They had two things they wanted to do, not the one, neutrality, don't speak. They also, there were two things going on. One was, first, to state a clear principle of neutrality. But then second, the part that often gets lost, they also want to open up a conversation about the boundaries of that principle. When is it okay for a college, or college to speak? What's the boundaries? Is it just an absolute thing, or are there boundary issues? And you can see that feature, now that you know that this, once you know it's there, in the report itself. Indeed, the report's framed with qualifiers. Oops, wait a minute. Uh, I'll come to that. So I'll come to that. To that for a second. So the, the, the report begins by saying that the function of the report is, quote, to provide a point of departure. So it begins by saying we're going to provide a point of departure for these discussions. And they lay, then they nail down this really strong principle, never say anything ever. But they say it's a point of departure. And the report ends by saying that principle, never say anything ever, is really a presumption, a weighty presumption in favor of silence. But presumptions can be overcome. And there are legal presumptions that can be, with certain weighty matters, be overridden. So he's thinking like his father was thinking like a First Amendment lawyer, a free speech advocate, but not an absolutist. He was interested in the possibility that reasons could arise that might lead a college president to have reason to speak, despite the principle. And you can probably see where I'm going by framing the question for this talk the way I did, at a Catholic college, is there, what's the presumption there? How does a Catholic community with a Catholic mission think about that presumption of silence? What are the conditions in which it can be overridden or should be overridden and a person might speak out? In the middle of the report, I know it's strange for me to talk about the report with you guys all the time. Hey, Tim. Nice to see you. <laughs> um, it, I, I know it's a little bit odd that I'm talking about this report all the time and you can't open your laptops. Or maybe if you opened it up, you wouldn't want to look up the Calvin Committee report. You could probably find 
better things in your computer to look at than that. But uh, I know it's a bit odd that I keep talking about the report without, without having, have, having you had read it. But you're reading a lot of it just by going here, just hearing this talk, because <laughs> it's not a very long report. In the middle of the report is this little thing that I call the Calvin Clause. So the report says, right, the main line is, do not speak. Remain neutral. Keep quiet, university leaders. And if you must express yourself, express as little as possible. And then we find in the middle of the report, or this, this line, from time to time, instances will arise in society in which society, or segments of it, threaten the very mission of the university and its values of, of free inquiry. In such a crisis, it becomes the obligation of the university as an institution to oppose such measures and to actively defend its interests and values. And remember that I mentioned that this report was coming out about 10 years after that Broyles bill, the bill that required, would have required, well, it did, it, 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 it asked the University of Chicago to give lists of all the known communists on the faculty over to the state legislature. That's the kind of threat they had in mind. There can be times when external forces, in the, in the heat of the moment, will ask the university to, to do things that undercut its own mission. And we can think of some other examples like that. But there are now, we're seeing now that there's going to be an exceptions, a class of exceptions to the general principle. And you know, in First Amendment law, the most important action of First Amendment law, okay, free speech, right? We're in favor of free speech. But the most interesting action on First Amendment law, and the reason why First Amendment law was such an incredibly important part of the intellectual history of the jurisprudence in the 20th century, was that the First Amendment law in the 20th century was doing all this work on the, on the boundaries. Free speech, well, always? What about fraudulent commercial claims? Have I got a bridge to sell you? Or like, buy this hair regrowth formula? Or inject yourself? All the, right? Free speech, right? But there's going to be categories like fraudulent commercial speech, or you know, here's my, here's the contract. We're going to rip you off, like blatantly rip you off on something. That's not allowed by free speech. What about direct incitements to violence? You know, go kill Joe right now. Here's some guns. Go do it. Here's, listen to me. Go kill Joe right now. Direct incitement to violence. The Constitution does not does not protect that kind of speech. So to find out what free speech really requires. You have to work on those boundary issues. And my thought is that, and Jamie Calvin puts this really nicely, the guy I mentioned. Oh, sorry, this, gee, this, is, this is the guy, their son, who I mentioned that I did the podcast with. Um, wrote this great piece about the unfinished business of the Calvin Report. It's weird, really weird, by the way, just as a qualifier, as a, as a complete aside. Jamie Calvin, I sent him an email. I never, I never met this guy. I barely ever heard of him. So I started reading around, you know, but I knew about his father. So I sent him an email, and I said, do you want to come on my, um, my podcast to talk about your this stuff? And um, he said, yeah, I, I will. And he came on my podcast. And if you watch it, it, we just dropped it last night. If you watch it, you might get a kick out of it, because in the beginning especially, we found out, he Googled around about me, and he found out that we're, we're, we're from the same tiny little town in northern Vermont, like this tiny little town called Underhill Center. So this is weird stuff in the beginning of the podcast where we're kind of realizing, and it turns out that, in fact, my mother, many years ago, many, many years ago, babysat Jamie Calvin's wife when she was a little kid. Now, I don't know if I guess that's probably warranty, but to me, you know, and for the life of, for, for nerds like me who like live in nerdy, a nerdy world, that's the kind of stuff that like, keeps me going. So anyway, Jamie Calvin, he says this. I remember, this is the guy who, at 28 years old, changed the course of his life because his father died. And he gave 10 years of his life to finishing his father's manuscript and reading his papers. He, this is what Jamie Calvin says in his essay. The tradition of freedom of speech takes the form of, an, of arguing about the content of that tradition. You don't, the tradition of free speech in America does not advance by just saying, free speech now. It develops by finding what the contours are. And he goes on, and a key measure of our stewardship, how we, what kind of stewards we are of the First Amendment, of First Amendment values, is the quality of that argument. 
is how well we look at those edge cases and think about the reasons. On this view, a principle is not diminished, but rather clarified and deepened by the process of mapping its boundaries. And I think something like that um, is true of the First Amendment, but I think something like that is also true of neutrality and of the Calvin principle that we've been talking about, about don't speak. I think that our understanding of institutional neutrality is in its infancy. A bunch of us, since the October attacks, are now talking about Calvin. Calvin's gotten cool, well, in my <laughs> for people like me, Calvin's gotten cool again. And we're all studying it and talking about it and reading about it. But I think that our understanding of Calvin and neutrality, and what that means for colleges and universities, is kind of at the place, like, the, like, like the place where First Amendment law was like in the 1940s or something. Free speech. Yeah, well, when, when not? And as they strengthened this free speech doctrine in America and developed a stronger, more robust account of why free speech should be protected, they largely did that by thinking about the exceptions, commercial speech, incitement to violence, other kind, maybe hate speech is out there now too. So those kinds of issues. And I think with Calvin and Neutrality, we're kind of in that same spot. We're needing to think to ourselves, how do we make it better? And I'm going to close with a couple of things. And I'm, I'm aware that you know, kind of dropping this neutrality it sound, probably sounds really weird to you. And just dropping this on you and asking you to teach me something about Providence College is probably a lot to ask. But I am going to ask that, as I warned you at the beginning. So it's coming. But let me just say a couple more things, then I'll stop. I'll try to. I'll try to sharpen the question for you in a way that you maybe can see it and work on it a little bit. <coughs> so this organization that, that I now run, Heterodox Academy, as I mentioned, we're committed to something like institutional neutrality. And um, yesterday, we, we, so we're, we're joining with these two other groups, FIRE, the Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression, a big free speech group, a big national free speech group, and another, and another group called the AFA, the Academic Freedom Alliance, a group of professors based at, started at Princeton who are, they defend one another when they're getting attacked. They're like NATO for professors. Heterodox Academy is a group that we're the biggest group of, of, of members, and we, um, we work on the culture. We work on the campus cultures. So FIRE takes care of the free speech rights. They're, threatened. They have a bunch, they're a bunch of lawyers. I mean, they're my friends, but they're lawyers. And they, <laughs> they um, you know, Whatever, they send letters to college presidents and say, listen, you've got this speech code not letting people speak on your campus. Are you sure you want to do that? So you've got some plaintiffs who are going to come chat with you about what that might cost you. So, you, so they, they, they've done this great job of opening up the removing free speech restrictions across campus and other, other important obstacles to equal liberty as well. HXA, by contrast, or in conjunction with them, we work on the culture. So once you have free speech at a place, no more free speech restrictions, the question still arises, how brave are the conversations on your campus? How open are they? Do people use that freedom in important ways? Do they use that freedom to expand one another's understanding, to, understand, to expand the understanding of the mission of this college, for example? Are there open conversations about that? Is that something you guys care about? What does it mean to care about that? That's what HXA does. And HXA is, is, is joined in with FIRE, that big group, and with the AFA. And we issued a joint press release a few weeks ago in which we're now advocating to college presidents across the country and in, and in Canada that they adopt neutrality. But HXA released our own version of the neutrality principle yesterday. It's on our website if you want to see it. And the little bit now coming to you, the important bit about the HXA model, as we call it, is that it's interested in trying to find ways to take the principles of neutrality and allow them to become more context dependent. So the Calvin Committee report was written for the University of Chicago by Chicago professors for that university and its traditions. How does it apply to Catholic college? Should Catholic presidents not speak on issues of the day, ever? What about an issue of the day that is relevant to the, to the mission of the university? What if there's a decision about abortion, for example, or a decision about the death penalty, or a decision about, I don't know, going back to Harry Dunster, pedo-baptism? What if there's things in the world that are happening that are relevant 
to Catholics, let's say, that might not be as relevant to the mission of, say, the University of Chicago. If you think that the university should speak only on issues directly concerning its mission, and you recognize that some universities and colleges' missions are broader than simply the pursuit of knowledge, then you have a more complicated metric to try to track, to try to steer by. Do you see what I mean? If you're Chicago, right, and you're, and you're completely not committed to anything as an organization except the pursuit of truth, then for you, hardcore neutrality or some version of hardcore neutrality is going to align with your mission and values. And if you say that now, and Calvin says, only speak if there's direct threats to your mission and values, which for Chicago is free speech and academic openness. But what if you're a faith community and you're pursuing truth and knowledge and you want disputation within the context of a shared faith understanding? Calvin says, I think, something like, only speak out when your mission is directly affected. Does that mean that the neutrality principle applies differently at a Catholic school like PC than it would apply, for example, at University of Chicago? or perhaps at Brown. We think that university leaders who adopt neutrality, the people who are trying to convince to adopt neutrality, will find that there is space for statesmanship. There's room for statesmanship as they think about their own university and college's mission, what they're trying to do in the world with this community, how and to find a balance between pursuing a faith tradition while being a university or a college that is being a place where contestation happens. So um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna leave, I'm gonna end it with that. With, 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 with that. And the question, I guess, maybe it's, maybe it's I'm aware it's, it's kind of floaty and a little bit ambiguous. I'm, I may not have sharpened it enough for you to, so you can really get your hands around it. But there, there's sort of two things I want you to think about. Generally, what kind of a place, what is a university? What kind of a place is this thing? What is a college? What does it mean? And the Calvin idea is that it's a place for learning and discovery above all else. And that's the only thing it should be. It shouldn't be a second-rate political actor. And then the second question is, well, does that seem right to you in the context of Providence College? Is, uh, is knowledge and the search for truth, all, comers, all, all the arguments welcome, the correct account of what PC is or should be? And if the university should only speak out, university leaders should only speak out in these various expressive ways, when the mission is directly implicated, what might that say about how the president of the PC should speak that might be in ways that might be different than the president of Williams, Northwestern, Stanford, Chicago, and the other places I mentioned? So I'll stop with that. Can I ask you, what I usually do is I, I instead of just taking questions from them, but I'll do that. I often have people turn to the person next to them and chat a little bit, and then we go together. Is it okay if I do that? Am I messing up? The, when's this going to end? 5.15, they won't come in. So, sorry, sorry. that was a little um, sort of voce something. Help me now with something. I'm going to ask you to turn to the person next to you, preferably not the, your roommate you came here with. I'll do that if you want. <laughs> Please turn to the person next to you. Intro oh, wait, wait, not yet. Introduce yourself. And take up some part of this question if you like. Should your president speak? Are you, are you, are you, have you heard your president speaking on anything? What have you thought about what they've said? Have they engaged in controversies? Should they engage in controversies? Should, you, should your college take a stand on things? Does Calvin convince you? So turn to the person next to you. We're going to do three minutes on the clock of your talking with the person next to you. And then we'll come back together and do it together. So ready, go. Thanks for coming. How you doing? What? Yeah, I'm not sure they have anything to say. Doesn't feel it. 
I'm John, by the way. Hi, Jim Keith. Have we met before? I don't know. You're an HXA member. I am indeed. I know. Yeah. Nice. I'm the Thank you. Director of the Humanities thing. So. Oh, excellent. Nice. Nice. Um, what, did you, what, was, what did you teach at Brown? Uh, my background's in philosophy, and I did um, political science and political philosophy. So political okay. theory. All right. What do you do? Theology. Oh, theology. But also humanities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's the two-year mandatory, right? That's part of it. But we also have a humanities major. Um, oh, nice. A bunch of events, including the humanities. Nice. Theology. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, how'd you find HXI? I, you know, someone approached me. Uh, I well, I teach Jonathan High School. Oh, nice. Coddling? The coddling? Or? Coddling. Yeah. Back on the classes right now. You should have brought everyone here, but it started at 4 30. So, uh, we teach a course on American conservative thought. Nice. And other guys. Nice. And we'll use, uh, Jonathan nice. Then I taught him, I'm t also teaching a class on freedom. And we'll use the second one, coddling the no, can't see in the American life. It yeah. isn't as good, but it's good. I agree, it's not as good. Well, that's not John's, that's, that's no. um, Greg's. Mostly that woman. Um, Ricky. Yeah. Ricky Schlott. Yeah, kind of the same. Yeah. But, you know, I should have, if, in you know, hindsight. It's, it's, like a, it's like part, like son of. It's like, mm. I, in the hindsight, I could have just done Conway. Yeah. Well, you taught both books in the class. You taught, did you teach? No, no, no. I, I teach a course on American conservative thought. Yeah. Going on. Yeah. That I'm teaching, Dean teaches, and I teach a course on freedom. Nice. And I use the canceling for that class. Nice. But I should have used it. In hindsight, I just should have. All of it. It's got the same stuff. Pretty much does, right? Yeah. Yeah, I, I ran. Lowry, we've been trying to get, we got him here during COVID, just on Zoom. So we need to get him in person. He's got some back issues, and, you know, he's, 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 also, he, he's also in crazy demand, you know, just like demented. Ridiculous. I've watched. I've watched. I've watched it blow up over the last few years. It's just incredible. But um, he's got some. He's hard to get around. And, but he's a. You, you know him. I mean, he's a treasure. He's just oh, like. I, mean, you know, I mean, he's just. He drives him crazy. Because he just. He's so contrarian. You know, just at Brown, it's just thorn in it. He's like Socrates, just like. Yeah, yeah, no, always. His department, he's always, after, he's like blowing out of all, I mean, he's my good friend, but he can't help. Oh, um, biology professor, he retired. Uh, Miller, uh, Jim Miller, what's it? I forgot. He retired. Okay. Hi there. Hi. Let's let's come back together again. So, thanks for doing that. If you were doing what I asked you to do. <laughs> so, um, how do you want to do it from here? So, what I thought you could do is, if you'd like to just say something that you came up with, or a smart idea you heard from somebody else. Anyone want to? Say anything about this? And the question is something like, when the, co when the Provident Providence College spe speaks, when the Providence College president speaks, what should he say? Do you want it? That's OK. Thank you so much for coming to speak with us today. Um, I. I hate to do this. I know I'm the first question, and I'm, I'm the first student to like, you know, answer that question that you just proposed or that we've been that has been proposed this entire time. Um, and I'm about to ask a question that's tangential. Um, so if if you don't want to answer it first, like we can like you could take it up later. Um, but I'm just kind of curious. Um, over the course of your um, talk, I've been kind of curious about the. Um, kind of the effects that this has on, or could have on, um, on admissions. Um, and like, um, so like being, Providence isn't, isn't just like a Catholic institution, it's specifically um, Dominican. And so in the Dominican 
um, spiritual tradition, there's a there's a tradition of of disputation and like um, like really kind of intensely kind of diving into opposing viewpoints and um, being yeah being unafraid to engage with opposing viewpoints. Um, and so I think that that's kind of like part of our mission, like specifically Dominican, in that we are dedicated to the pursuit of truth um, with like that like kind of um, like ability and um, desire to engage with like really kind of sophistic in a sophisticated manner other opposing viewpoints. I'm wondering if um, we should be tailoring the way in which we recruit students um, to that, like, um, should we be like kind of recruiting students that are open to that that mission? I guess and like being more clear about about what it is um, than like just kind of I don't know, like having kind of diluting the mission in a way, and like having students who actually might be vehemently kind of opposed to the mission, and like kind of um, yeah, I don't know. Sorry, that was kind of ranty, but so. That's your friend, tangential. <laughs> Please give me more tangential questions. So that's the kind of thing I, I meant when I said at the beginning that I'm not asking the question because I know the answer and I'm here to tell you what it is. I'm asking the question to ask the question. I know, I know, Dominican, I know DC. Um, but I'm still wondering what that means. Like, what does that? What What does what you said mean? And the first part, let's put the admissions bit aside for a minute. I think it's a great question. Because it kind of, they're connected to the mission. But let's, just for now, put that aside. Tell me, what are the boundaries of disputation and contestation and open-minded thinking created by a Dominican framework? It's not the same thing, I don't think, as the boundaries that would be affirmed by the University of Chicago which I think says, <laughs> bring it all, right? And we're in an equal measure, maybe. You know, I don't know, Satanist, who knows? <laughs> bring it all. What, can anyone, I mean, oh, this is for you, but anyone who wants, is there some way to say what the Dominican, what the boundaries of Dominican open viewpoint diversity are? Please. Yeah, we, we have, an HXA member. gay marriage, uh, and this, the college canceled it. Uh, and so after that, we formulated a speaker policy, and it goes this way. Um, the only, no speech, no, no, no uh, talk sponsored by a faculty member that is within the college community, so it's not a particularly public talk, but it's a, it's just advertised internally. Um, the college can only intervene when it's clear from the title of the talk that a central teaching of the Catholic Church is going to be challenged. Interesting. And in that instance, the only because, thing that... So a central teaching of the Catholic Church being challenged. Is going to be challenged from the title of the talk, not from who, who's the speaker or what something that the speaker said some other place or what you think the speaker might say, it's got to be clear from the title. And in that case, all the, this, the, this, what the college can do is ask for a format change to include a respondent. And as long as the, uh, the organizers of that talk agree to that, the event goes forward. Nice. So the only, the only way it can be canceled is that if the college asks for a respondent so a person can come in, a speaker could be invited, who's going to um, criticize abortion. Well, uh, oh, sorry, it's going to it's going to oh, yeah. it's going to advocate abortion. Yes. So long as there's a person on both sides of that topic, yep. death penalty, whatever we're going to do. Yep. That's pretty open. I mean, that's pretty open. I mean, Chicago is Chicago more open than that? I guess Chicago says you don't have to have a pairing. You can
can always just have one person bringing it to you. But it sounds like requiring a pairing in many ways is more open than just saying just bring it on. That's cool. Well, I feel like in that sense, the pairing is only going one way. So if it's as, I don't know, I'm only hearing this just now, but like if it's in regards to something that's in line with the Catholic mission, but might be still in contention, is there still no requirement for the respondent? Like, is that only when it's an imposing view? Because I feel like then that's where it maybe would be still kind of closed. And there's a little asymmetry now, I'm realizing, just thinking about you and about Chicago. So let's say, let's say someone in PC wanted to have someone come giving a talk where the title makes it clear they're going to advocate a male-only priesthood. So they're going to say, doctrine. They're not now required to have someone bringing the contrary view in. So there's going to be kind of a little funky asymmetry going on, right? Where if we're doing full Chicago plus every topic and every issue would always have two people. But now this little little wrinkle, right? A little toggle switch maybe. But it's still really interesting. Awesome, thank you. Hi. Um I think I watched your podcast with Stephen Peckin of the idea of like um Was colleges. It? Stephen Peckin. Pinker. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. So um, with that podcast and looking what's wrong with universities, I kind of wanted to bring up because in Stephen, he brought a lot about the common knowledge and intellectual knowledge. And you talked a lot about the idea of staying um, neutrality, especially in institutions. Yep. Wondering how could that contribute to the common knowledge here? And also how could that contribute to more inclusive dialogue or inclusive diversity, especially it is a PWI in here. so most times many students of color don't feel like there's much of inclusivity and so how would you think that could with the neutrality contribute to maybe a more of an inclusive environment or space that's good that's good so with with um with inclusion again the neutrality doctrine as i sort of laid it out always sends us back to mission and function and purpose of the university so if you think the function of the university includes inclusion in some important way and I think most university missions do include elements about that. Even the Chicago, pure Chicago model wants a variety of viewpoints. So viewpoints that haven't been allowed to be spoken or haven't been included probably need to be included for the search for truth. And you know, some of you may know this, but like the, the, the degree of inclusion in our universities is kind of a very recent occurrence. An achievement still underway, I would say. So the last Ivy League school to start giving degrees to women was Columbia, and those degrees weren't given to women until 19, 1987. That's yesterday by, from my perspective. If not from yours, you weren't, even, you weren't around yet, but that's yesterday. That's how recently these elite schools are allowing women, any women, to graduate. And we could do the same thing for racial minorities and all that. You know, so there's that question. I think your question runs right into the, the, the machinery that I was describing. What's the mission of the university? And how much does inclusion connect with that mission? What does it mean to be inclusive? Do you just count people up by racial group or gender or sexuality? How do you get a truly inclusive university? Even if you have even numbers of people in the room, or proportional, whatever it might be, you still have traditions. You know, the, the library with shelves groaning with books written by white males, because that's where we come from. What would it mean to be fully included? It's, it's, it's an interesting and really hard question. But I, I love the concept. So thanks. I didn't answer that very well at all, but it's, I just want to park it. Mark is a really great and difficult question. Please. 
Hi. Uh, so I'd like to offer an analogy. I hope this would this would help. Um, Flannery O'Connor, Catholic writer, um, she was often asked if her Catholicism limited her sort of literary scope, her literary genius. And her response was always the same response, that it added to her perspective, that her Catholicism added entirely higher dimensions to her look at the world. Didn't take anything away, didn't limit anything. Right. And I'm thinking at, at a university, um, certainly scientists can explain how the world works. Uh, physicists and biologists and chemists can explain a lot of that, most of that, to us. But if you say, you know, why is there a universe to begin with, it's not a legitimate question for most intellectuals. That's just off the table. But at the Catholic College, that's on the table. It's actually that sort of added something that is allowed to be discussed. It, it could be an intellectual discussion. Or something like the purpose of life. Most disciplines would think, well, that's, cur that's interesting, curious. It's not legitimate. It's not a legitimate God. kind of conversation. Yeah, that's great. But a Catholic college would say, yeah, well, that's part of what we should be talking about. Nice. Nice. So you're saying, and I, 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 probably didn't, I probably didn't say what you're correcting me for having said, but I was kind of thinking it. And somehow you saw that. I didn't say faith, you know, colleges with a faith-faith mission are going to have narrower ranges of discourse. I was thinking that. <laughs> and you're pointing out that in lots of ways, faith-faith colleges can point to topics and direct intellectual resources into areas of inquiry that might be neglected in our society by a, a more secular University of Chicago, blah, 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 whatever it might be. I gave a talk in New York a week ago to a group called the Maimonides Fund, a bunch of Jewish, uh, very active Jewish um, people, and people involved in universities. And the president of Yeshiva College was there, and he made a very similar point. He was talking about in, this, in these days uh, of the attacks, the Yeshiva, they're really talking about deep issues about uh, you know, what this means for the Jewish people, and what, what, how does this connect to some other, to Jacob's story and other stories that, they, that they've read, and what, you know, how, what do you make of this? A deep question uniquely deep, or at least unique to faith-based institutions. So I, I appreciate that point a lot. And that goes, as HXA works on the model that we just released yesterday, you know, really important to me, thing for the model for me is that the Calvin approach is not for every university just as it is. There's something there, I think, for all of us, every university. But context matters a lot, and that helps me see more how it might apply differently, for example, at PC. Yeah, no, this is wonderfully interesting stuff, and I'd like to invite you to uh, pursue, or invite all of us to pursue a little more deeply um, the uh, contextual application of institutional neutrality. Yeah. And I want to do this by uh, building off uh, the very first questioner's invocation of the specifically Dominican uh, mission of the college. Uh, part of what that means uh, does entail a certain privileging of the uh, disputed question. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna just for fun, because I'm feeling a little mischievous right now, but propose an idea that I'm sure would go nowhere and is probably uh, bad for all sorts of reasons. But uh, nonetheless- Great warm up. Yeah, yeah, I just, I just wanna do it because I can. And, and so um, the idea here, I mean, what I'm hearing from uh, sort of a, a strict Calvinistic perspective uh, is that um, uh, the default option for respecting institutional neutrality would be silence. That seems terribly unimaginative. Um, what, what, why should silence be the go-to thing when you're trying to be Switzerland, um, when, you're, when you're trying to be neutral? And I wonder if the Dominican tradition um, has within itself a more imaginative and context faithful implementation of what's behind the ideal of neutrality, which would be something like, oh no, rather than um, just have the president or whoever be silent, why not uh, try to frame or encapsulate the controverted issue of the day in the form of a disputed question? <laughs> and you would precisely not be um, issuing a magisterial determinatio as to where the truth lies on this side or that side, but you would simply be contextualizing and framing 
in, in a way that would harness the resources of Dominican tradition, which privileges the disputed question, and it would serve something which is far um, superior to the uh, decidedly tendentious takes, as we now say, that get served up to us by the popular media. And I mean, I, so my, my question would be, A, <laughs> is this a good idea at all? <laughs> Probably not. And B, um, w would that be an alternate and perhaps more imaginative way of respecting, the, respecting and applying the principle of neutrality than mere um, silence? I mean, I do believe that um, there is such a thing as principled silence, but I also know that often uh, what masquerades as principled silence is actually cowardly silence or evasive silence. And so I'm just wondering if this would be a way of implementing it uh, in a way that would actually be faithful, not just to Catholic universities in general, but to the particularly uh, Dominican charism of uh, this college. Yeah, I, I love that. So uh, you, you, um, let me do neutrality two different ways. I've, I've done it one way, let me do it two different ways, and we can add yours as a third. And I'll, I'll ask you to sharpen it. So one way is what I said. Neutrality, a la Calvin, is <laughs> Why? Because, right? That's neutrality one, right? Neutrality two, we might say, neutrality is something like parity to different sides. So you say, you know, there's a big controversy. You say, well, you know, some people think this, some people think that, some people think, think, think that. That's neutrality. You're not taking a view. You're saying there are these different views out there. Is your framing view that a version of that? Or is the framing view that? It sounded, it sounded more interesting. Nice. Nice. So it's a way to elevate it. So you, what, oh, can I ask him, I don't know if you want to, but I want, are, we, are you going to dinner? Can you come to dinner? I want to ask you questions. <laughs> but it's, just, it's interesting to think if there's an example, right? If the Supreme Court makes a decision about abortion, is there a way that a presidential statement could talk about that? Well, where are we at? We, I'm, I'm always worried about keeping people longer than I said I would keep them. We have a student question back here. Let's do that, then I'll talk. Maybe, maybe one, no? All right. Let's, we can follow through email, too. Oh, never mind. This, this student's sitting Oh, come time. on. Connor, do you want, you want to do it? Um, so thank you so much uh, for being here today. Um, so you suggested or said that this was written at the end of the 60s, is that correct? 67. Right, so 67, obviously, um, you know, Vietnam and a whole lot of things in society that we were at the forefront. Um, and so when I think about schools, I think it's, of course, very important that all views are heard and that folks feel safe to speak freely. But I also think that, you know, schools are also at the forefront of our society and should be at the forefront of our societal thinking. Um, and especially on issues like war and peace and the rights of people. Um, and so I think, you know, thinking back to the 60s as someone who's very fascinated with the 60s, um, I think it is safe to say on a few of the issues that were being, you know, um, uh, you know, just, uh, yeah, like at the time, <clears throat> excuse me, um, that certainly there was a right side and like a wrong side. Or, or it seems from our view of history that's the case. Um, so I guess the question I want to ask is that how can schools, I guess, remain at the forefront of that? And maybe it's just me. Maybe you don't believe that, and that's fine. But I do believe that there are certain things that are, like, right and certain things that are wrong. So, um, yeah, and it was hard to sort of sit here and formulate that because that's, like, a a thought that I had just thought up as I was speaking, but um, yeah, just like the 60s and all of the stuff that was happening awesome. then and now. It's awesome. So I, I dragged this thing again, right, which you were recognizing I said before. And there's some, this idea that a lot of people have, 
And history may bear it out, but it's kind of interesting when you look closely whether it does or not, whether history does bear it out or not. That young people have a, an idealism and a view for an impatience with the status quo, which can be pretty powerful and pretty startling. And some people think has a record of showing us the progressive future. Now, if you look more closely, it's not always clear. There are a lot of people walking around in the 60s thinking that they would always wear bare feet and have really long hair and have sex with everyone, whatever, summer of love, right? And that didn't actually, or that they thought Mao had everything going on, or, you know, and they were wrong, a bunch of, bunch of stuff. But there is this thing, right, that there's something, there's this idea that colleges, especially because of the students, are, inc are intense incubators of radical challenges to the way we see things. That the status quo that your parents kind of accept, that they, they live our lives when we get older and we kind of, you know, do our, you guys aren't there yet. You're still like fresh and open to possibilities. And Calvin, though, would say that's exactly what a university should be. You want young people to be free, fully free, to think in new ways about these issues. And if you have the college president weighing in quickly, kind of giving some semi-bland agreement about this, they kind of take the life out of the conversation. So it's kind of a daring thing that's, I think, aligned with what, with what you're saying. I mean, it's, what it denies a, a student activist, I'm a, what would deny it, a, a student activist says, I want this, my college to speak for me on this issue, on my way. That's off the table now. And that can be pretty disappointing. But the thought is that now you're free as an individual, as a member of communities and groups that you're part of voluntarily, to speak any way you want without the right answer having already been spoken before you got a chance to speak. But I love your question. I sure. really appreciate yeah. it. Let's give a warm round of applause for Dr. Tomasi. <laughs> and as always, you can head next door to the great room for treats.